All right, so let's talk about open source licensing and go to market for startups. Brief introduction to myself. I'm a former developer who for the past 15 years has been doing sales and marketing for early stage developer focused startups. And uh, I've had a variety, each of these companies had a variety of relationships with open source. Uh, at Circle CI, we were a completely closed source company, but our two primary competitors, Jenkins and Travis CI were open source. Uh, then I was at a company called Serverless where we were an MIT licensed completely open source product called the Serverless Framework. Uh, then Courier where um, we had open source libraries, SDKs we maintained, the core product was closed. And now I'm at a company called Dragonfly where we are a business source license uh, also known as, as source available. So I'm going to talk about kind of these different uh, relationships with open sources, strategies, setbacks to these various approaches. And I actually need to look up here a little bit because I don't, can't see it on my computer, but um, just a brief history. I'm a huge history fan, love to kind of start with understanding the historical context of any topic story. So. Uh, software kind of began as a concept in the 50s and 60s and initially it was really part of academia and it was treated like any other academic research. Just like if you published a paper on biology or sociology or history, it was open for anyone to analyze, utilize in their own research. That's kind of the place that, that software started from. And it was typically bundled with hardware. You would, you would get an IBM mainframe, you'd get some sort of computer, it had software uh, attached to it, and that's how you got access to the software. Um, in 1969, there was a landmark case, US versus IBM, which es essentially said, hey, uh, packaging software with hardware is, is anti-competitive. You need to let developers, let engineers, let end users put their own software on, on the computers if they want. And that's really what set the stage for there to be a commercial software industry, for us as developers to be able to build software, sell it. Microsoft was founded shortly after that in, this, in 1975. You can kind of consider them the first software startup, the original software startup. Um, and as a reaction to that in the 80s, there was the GNU project as well as the Free Software Foundation. And this was kind of a pushback to say, hey, we want to have some safeguards, some safe place for there still to be this free and open source software. We don't want all software to be commercial. Um, and then you had the internet era in the late 90s where the amount of software being built exploded. Uh, the cost to build that software increased dramatically. And, you know, on the commercial side, you kind of had Oracle and a couple of closed systems. And then you had what was the, like the LAMP stack and then a few other CMSs and web frameworks based on those that developers really started flocking to that to say, hey, these are open frameworks that I can just grab off the shelf and start building really quickly and easily. And I think that internet explosion and LAMP stack was kind of the birth of, of the open source ecosystems as we think of them today. Uh, and now to talk about commercial open source specifically, so businesses built around open source, that, that really started in 1999 when Red Hat IPO'd. That was the first uh, sign that, hey, there's an industry behind open source. We can build businesses with open source at the core. And, and Red Hat showed that that can be done with a dual licensing model, which dual licensing is basically saying, hey, we have one version of the product that is open source license. You can take it, do whatever you want with it. It is free and open source software. And then we have a second product that has a commercial license. You can pay us as the company behind it to install it on your own hardware and, and run that for your business. And you're gonna get additional features, security, you know, a variety of things that can be added into that second part of the product. And this opened, uh, this opened a whole new set of, of investors coming on the scene after Red Hat saying, hey, we want to fund the next Red Hat. So roughly from 1999 uh, through 2009, there was hundreds, dozens, if not hundreds of startups founded and, and funded pursuing, you know, trying to be the next Red Hat. Most of them fail. Like, there's not a lot of successful open source startups that came out of this period. They were still trying to figure a lot of things out. But starting around 2009, you had uh, MongoDB, then HashiCorp, Elastic, Databricks, Confluent. You started to have these startups founded that were able to repeat that dual licensing model that Red Hat was successful with. 
and, and build really success, successful, sustainable businesses. All, all these companies up here, I believe except for Databricks has not IPO'd yet. All the other ones um, have IPO'd. So then, then comes the cloud platforms. And this, this changed the, the equation of building an open source commercial startup quite a bit. Um, AWS launched in 2006. You know, by the mid to 2014, 2015, they had built a very lucrative business on taking open source software built by other venture funded commercial companies and offering them on, on their global hardware, right? There's a variety of services listed up here that do that. There, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, and if you're AWS, this is great, right? You don't have to necessarily invest in all the R&D to build this software. You can put it on, on your infrastructure, which is larger scale than anyone else. And you're not breaking any laws. The, the licensing says you can do this. And for, for the companies that invested often hundreds of millions of dollars to develop this very complex, very powerful software, it, it showed them two interesting things. For the most part, these companies were still building their business with, with a licensing model that said, hey, the dual licensing model, right? Their customers were still uh, deploying their product on-premise on their own infrastructure. Uh, AWS showed that, hey, the cloud distribution model is more effective, quicker time to market, higher margins. The, that, that's a, that's a, a real model you should be pursuing. But it also showed these open source startups that, hey, you're now competing against us with your own product. We're taking your own product, we're competing against you. Um, and that's when the licensing story really changed for these companies. They decided, hey, the permissive open source licenses we, we've been pursuing are no longer sustainable. And that was when a new licensing model that's often referred to as source available emerged. So what, what is source available, right? This is, this is a topic that um, gets very heated on, on Hacker News, on GitHub, on Twitter. Essentially what source available means is that the code is open and available, just like with traditional open source. You can go to GitHub, you can look at the code, it's there. It also still has the same frictionless developer adoption experience. You can download it, you can run it on your own machine, you don't need to sign up, you don't need to opt into any terms of service. It's, it's, it's frictionless to use, but there are restrictions on, on some usage. Typically, the restriction says you cannot take this software and run it as a cloud-hosted service to compete with us. You can put it in your SaaS product and sell another service that it's a component of, but you cannot compete directly as us as the company that's developing that software. So why, why did these emerge, right? We talked a little bit about the clouds coming and, and AWS in particular. That was a, a primary reason, uh, the competitive threats there. Um, but that the, this, this millions of dollars that was being invested from venture-backed companies into developing the software simply was not going to continue to flow unless a new licensing model was figured out. You're not, you were no longer able to go raise money from VC saying, hey, and, and I, I experienced this in 2015, 2014 with, when I was at serverless, we would get term sheets from VC saying, hey, you have an MIT licensed piece of software, take this money and just go get as much developer adoption as possible, we'll figure out the monetization later. That was no longer really an option um, because the competitive threat from the big clouds was simply too great. So if you wanted to go and continue to raise money to, to build this software, you needed to come up with a different licensing model. And I apologize, uh, keep needing to look up here. I don't have the same thing on my computer. Um, oh, and then, yeah, finally, the alternative was founders could just go build closed source software, right? They could just say, hey, we're giving up on the whole open source thing. We're just not going to have that. But there's st still a really strong desire from engineers and from developers to have their source code open. So this business source license let them do that while protecting their business. <clears throat> and, and I really like this well analogy. I didn't, uh, I didn't invent this. I've seen this other places. But you can kind of think of, of software as a well. You can think of open source developers as well diggers. And you know, some wells have, have really great fresh water at the bottom. Some have water that's, that's not so tasty, not so valuable. And you know, traditional permissive open source says, hey, we want any, anyone can come drink this water, and anyone can come package it and sell it. 
we want full access for any use to this well. Whereas business source essentially says, hey, you can come and drink the water, but you can't bottle it and sell it. And I think that's a really good way to, to think about the difference. And Mongo, MongoDB was one of the first companies to adopt this license. And I think, you know, every, all the companies that have adopted this license have put out their own statements to say, hey, this is why we did it. I think Mongo's is, is especially good. You know, they say the market is quickly trying to, is, is quickly moving to consume most software as a service. This is a time of incredible opportunity for open source projects with the potential to foster a new wave of great open source server side software. The reality, however, is that once an open source project becomes interesting, it is too easy for large cloud developers to capture all the value but contribute nothing back to the community. Given the risk, small companies are unwilling to make that bat bet, so most software being written is closed sourced. The community needs a new license that builds on the spirit of the APG AGPL, but makes explicit the conditions for providing the software as a service. And this is the same mindset, same thought process that most of those companies I listed earlier went through. And this licensing change has evolved with the go-to-market, which is to deliver software via the cloud. And, and you can look at, these are the four, four companies I was referencing earlier that, that have all IPO'd, so I was able to pull all this data from uh, quarterly reports. And you can see, you know, when, when they all started offering their cloud services, you know, between 2016 and 2019, prior to that, it was all on-premise on installs. When, you know, they adopted that, their source available licenses, which for the most part was within a few years after that, and then I think what's really interesting to see is how uh, along with this, their, their revenue models are shifting to cloud services. So you can see, you know, Mongo in the last couple of years went from 50% of their revenue on cloud to 70, Elastic from 35 to 40, Confluent from 30 to 50. As companies are, are shifting their distribution model to the cloud, they're having to evolve that licensing model as well. So, so for the next generation of open source founders, for the next set of, of companies, how should, how should you think about um, you know, open source and, and go to market? So I believe that traditional kind of open source as a commercial strategy is, is really obsolete, especially if you're going to deliver via the cloud. If that's gonna be your distribution model, you need to figure out a model that fits that business. If you want your source code to be open, that probably means some some version of business source model, a business source license. The, the, the reason you're building a business is, is not to, to fit the strict definitions of open source. It's not to make uh, anyone happy other than your customers, right? The purpose of building a business is to deliver value for your customers and you should choose the model that's going to accomplish that best. And I think, you know, as you, as you think about the essential pieces of go-to-market, which is your product, your promotion, your distribution, and your price, each of those, each of those should be thought through as you think through your licensing, and they should, they should make sense together. Um, and finally, as I was mentioning earlier, your licensing uh, strategy is gonna have to be an essential part of your fundraising model. When you, if you have an open, if you're lucky enough to have a, a popular open source project, and you go to the venture community, you go to investors and say, hey, I wanna build a business around this. They're gonna ask you, okay, what, what, why did you select this license? How is that gonna impact your ability to monetize your product and build a business? Uh, which surprisingly wasn't really the case, you know, five, seven years ago, they didn't ask these hard questions. They just said, hey, you have an open source project that's popular with developers, that's great, here's a check. Things have changed and you really are gonna to have to have uh, great answers to these questions. So a, a few predictions that, that I believe are going to play out as, as we kind of evolve as, as a commercial open source industry. Um, I do think that source available is going to be the default license. I think it's the best thing available to us today. Um, doesn't mean it will be forever. I think that making code open is going to be an essential part of go-to-market. It's going to be an essential part of getting developer adoption. It's going to be an essential part of building trust and security. And, and when you're selling to enterprise customers, having them to easily be able to review your code. 
but I think it's going to be less essential for most companies as a ability, as a, a way to develop their product, right? And I think you're already seeing that. A lot of the popular business source licenses today, they're not taking tons of external contributions. They're not even soliciting tons of external contributions. That's not the primary reason they're making their source code available. Um, I think components of the e ecosystem, I think you'll see companies where a big components of the ecosystem are available. And you're, you're seeing this trend today with AI companies a lot. They might you know, make uh, some of their training data public, uh, open source. They might make some of the libraries and frameworks. But the core product that they're selling, they're keeping closed. And I think that's a trend you're gonna, gonna start seeing a lot more. Um, and I, I think we'll continue to see innovation and licensing to figure out a better, the best balance of giving developers free and open access while protecting the business, right? Because if we, if we can't figure that out, what's going to happen is VC money is gonna dry up from going into investing in open source, and we're gonna see a dramatic decline in the innovation that happens in this space. Um, and then finally, today, cloud is the primary distribution or the hottest distribution channel for software. Whatever distribution model comes next is going to change the licensing story. It's going to change the go-to-market story. Everything here is going to be different, whatever that next distribution model is. So I'd love to leave like have some some time for anyone here to ask questions, have a discussion about this. Uh, I know it can be a, a touchy touchy topic for some, controversial. Um, you know, there's the religion wars on on Twitter and Hacker News where people say, "Hey, this isn't real open source. We 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 don't recognize that as real open source." But if there's any questions around the commercial aspect, building a real a, a business around this, um, yeah, feel free to to ask away. Yeah, great question. For, for anyone that couldn't hear, uh, his question was, what happens in practice if, if somebody breaks your license and actually does build a competing service? Um, in practice, the only companies that people are concerned with, with those licenses, for the most part, is AWS and maybe Google and Azure. And those companies are extremely conservative from a legal standpoint. And they actually have rules where their developers are not even allowed to, to look at BSL licensed code. So um, I think it, I, I, not, basically nothing's gone to trial that I know of. There's never been any litigation around it. Um, it's basically a way to prevent those hyperscale cloud providers from competing. Uh, and I don't think there's actually been any, any litigation that I'm aware of on that. Um, any other questions? Yep. Always been, oh, thanks. Has Dragonfly always been dual license, or did you start fully open then transition into one of those like business licenses? Yeah, so Dragonfly is a, we just started the project under two years ago, so it's still, or just about two years ago now. So we started with BSL, business source license, from the very beginning. Um, and we had the luxury of hindsight and seeing what had happened with a lot of these other companies and being able to make that decision from the beginning. But obviously, you know, Mongo, Confluent, Hashi, they, these business source licenses didn't really exist when they were founded, so they had to go through, I think what you could label a pretty painful transition period in, in changing that license. But for us, we were always, from the beginning, a business source license. Yeah, hi. Uh, are there boilerplate uh, source available licenses, like one around Apache and one around GPL or whatever? And where yeah. do you find those? Yeah, yeah, there are. Um, I think Confluent, Cockroach, Mongo, they've all shared theirs as kind of boilerplate. And the two, the two you see most common are business source, which basically says what I described. And it, it also has a provision in it. You can set the amount of years, but 
after a certain amount of years, the code does become open. So like the version that's released today, for example, will be fully open in four years. Um, and then there's the, uh, the other popular one is server-side public license, which basically says you actually can release a cloud service on it, but you must open source every component API piece of that. And again, you can basically call it like an anti AWS or Google, because they will never do that. But those are the two main flavors. Um, and yeah, they, there are templates you can, you can find online for that. Hi, um, I have a question on um, the legal implications of um, open source available or source open. Um, I heard a lot of these things that companies, especially large enterprises, are not willing to implement source available um, software because um, we're just running the risk of, of going into some legal problems and so the legal departments don't sign off um, the, the software. Um, and especially, I think one of the big stories of last year was HashiCorp when they uh, decided to change the license. I mean, it kickstarts the whole thing around open tofu and everything. Um, I just want to hear your, um, your opinion on this. Like, where will this go? What's the current state around the acceptance of um, these licenses and enterprises? Yeah, yeah, great question. So the, the question was around the hesitancy of certain enterprises to adopt uh, source available licenses. I can't speak for HashiCorp, and they're, they're a bit different than, than a lot of the other companies I've been talking about in that they're not a database or critical infrastructure, they're kind of a set of DevOps tools. I can speak for the customers that, that I deal with at, at Dragonfly. I've never had, and you know, we're, our open source version is implemented in, in dozens of, of Fortune 500 companies, and I've never had a company uh, not implement because of that. There has been some requests for more information and, and them wanting to learn about it more because it is relatively new. But once they understand what the implications of the license are, I've never had that be a, a point of friction for adoption. Yeah. Uh, do you see any um, challenges uh, regarding com com uh, co sorry, community work or uh, with partnerships in, uh, in selecting uh, that type of license? Yeah. Uh, personally, I've, I don't think so. I think the, the one, I think it actually opens up some opportunities for partnerships because um, so, so I mentioned the, the typical restriction is that you cannot launch a competing cloud service without permission. So a, a partnership avenue or channel it does open is to say, hey, we would love, like a company can come to Dragonfly and say, hey, we would love to offer Dragonfly as a cloud hosted service on our platform. And then we're, now we're discussing a licensing conversation. Whereas, you know, you've heard several talks today of people saying, oh, all of a sudden I see somebody is using my open source as their own product or all of a sudden it's being used. There has to be a licensing discussion there. But if they're not wanting to offer it as a cloud solution, there's really no other restrictions on it. So I, I personally haven't seen it block anything other than that. And then it becomes a, a, a partnership conversation with, with a revenue share typically is typically how they're structured. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, uh, is it a provision for uh, f licensing certain features in an open source product? Sorry, could you repeat that one more time? Yeah. Is there a provision for licensing certain features in an open source product? Is it possible to open source certain features? No. Is it possible to license certain features on an open source product? Poss is it possible? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's typically the dual license model where you have a subset of, of the product that is open source and available, and then you sell licensing for, for additional features. So I think this is actually like probably one of the oldest models is to say, hey, Here's, uh, here's some features you get in open source, here's others. The, the, the typical model with these source available licenses is to say, hey, it's all open source, and then us as the commercial company behind it, we are offering it as a cloud service. Typically, you, we, we don't hold back any features, it's just the control plane, it's just the cloud platform that's offered on top of it. Awesome. Well, yeah, if you have any additional questions, love to, I love to talk about this stuff. Come visit the Dragonfly booth, L32. Shoot me an email. Happy to chat more. All right. Big round of applause.